Welcome to Soma this evening. If you're here for the first time, special welcome. You're excited that you're spending this evening with us. If you and I have not gotten the chance to meet, my name is Dre. I'm one of the weekend teaching pastors here at Rocky Peak. And this is an awesome privilege of me to be able to come up here and to be able to continue this series that Kelly kicked off a couple weeks ago. Now I'm going to go into a time of prayer and we're going to get started. But specifically, some of you might be wondering, well, where's Kelly? Well, Kelly and a team from Soma, they have just recently landed in Tanzania. And they're going to be there for the next couple weeks doing some awesome things so as we kick things off I would love if you would join me as we pray over this team father what an amazing privilege that following Jesus that proclaiming that Jesus is real Jesus has changed everything that his kingdom is here is not something we simply do here in Chatsworth or on the west coast or in America but it is a global message when you said go and make disciples of all nations, you weren't kidding. You meant all nations. And what an amazing gift that a team from this room, that a team of students of college age and young adult students, just like the people sitting in here, are going to the other side of the world to help our brothers and sisters strengthen the church. One thing I want to pray right now, Lord, is I want to pray for their trust. Father, when we go out of what we know, when we go out of our, quote, normal reality, when we go out of our everyday comfortability, we realize we need a new level of trust like we've never had before. And so, Father, I pray that any barriers towards them seeing you are removed. I pray that they hear you clearly. I pray that they see you clearly through prayer, through your word, through one another. I pray that you give them courage and boldness. The New Testament tells us that you did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. Father, the Holy Spirit that we have in us tonight is the Holy Spirit that is with them on the other side of the world. We pray that they rely on that Holy Spirit to be their sustenance, and we look forward to hearing what you did through them when they come back. Father, tonight as we open up your precious word, as I often pray, let me as the communicator become less. Let you as our king who has brought the kingdom become much, much more. In your son's name, we all set. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have some fun tonight, so Missy. What I get to do tonight is I get to continue this series that Kelly kicked off a few weeks ago called Ask It. Now, if you weren't here when that happened, the basic premise of this series is that we as Christ followers want to be a people that are regularly seeking wisdom. If you were here a few weeks ago, Kelly asked you to raise your hands. You don't need to do that right now. But he asked, is there ever been a situation in your life that you handled it poorly? That if only you had wisdom in that situation, the outcome and the pain would have been very different. And see, that's what we're called to as Christ followers. We are called to be a people of wisdom. But here's the trick. Wisdom does not come naturally because of sin. See, sin did a number in our lives. Sin separated us from God, our source of wisdom. Sin took us from light into darkness. And so when Jesus comes into our lives, he restores us. But one thing we need to learn as we learn to follow Jesus is we need to learn how to become that person he created us to be. And so the thing is, wisdom does not come naturally. And ways that I mean by that is sometimes we think wisdom will naturally happen when we get older. I have met many dumb old people. <laughs> sometimes we think wisdom will happen through experiences. I have met many dumb people who have had a lot of, quote, life experience. Wisdom, the only source of it is God-given. And so often in our life, we don't pursue wisdom because we don't understand the value of it. And so to paint a picture of that, I want to ask you a rhetorical question this evening. But I want you to, but I hope it's a reflective question. How old were you? Or when in your life did you realize that you knew everything about everything? <laughs> and if you're sitting there going, I have never been like that, you are a liar. <laughs> Because it's the natural evolution of life. See, I have three small kids, so I never sleep. And what I see in my kids is the beauty of what we once were. See, there was a point in all of our lives in which we were inquisitive. In which if you've spent time around kids, the number one thing they ask, why? 
And it's sometimes annoying because they ask it so often, but when you look at the big picture, they ask it because they're trying to understand their world. They're trying to understand how things work. They're trying to be students. But something happens in life, i.e. sin, in which we stop asking why. We stop asking questions and we start making assumptions. And all of a sudden, we leave this posture of learning and we adopt this posture of arrogance. And I'm not saying this because I didn't experience this. I'm saying this because I was as guilty as anybody else where all of a sudden we assume we know everything. And there are things that God has wired us to have a deeper knowledge than other people. But we can become arrogant in that, and all of a sudden we're convinced we know things we have no business talking about. Let me give you a couple clear, clear examples. Have you ever read, and I'm not going to have you raise your hand, or have you ever participated in an internet comment section? Are those people genuinely trying to understand something? Let alone, I, and something you'll know about, you'll learn about me, I hate arguing. However, I love discussion. I love different viewpoints discussing. That does not happen in an internet comment section, does it? Because instead of people going, I hold this viewpoint, but let me hear, let me learn your viewpoint, what do you fight with? Assumptions. And I'm guilty of that when somebody challenges something you hold to be true. Do you try to understand or do you jump in with assumptions? Let me give you another example. How many of you ever watch the Olympics? How many of you like actually get into the Olympics, you know? Like we kind of like have to pretend like we do to be patriotic. Like every, <laughs> every four years is like, oh yeah, I care about them running around the track a bunch of times, you know, or anything like that. I'm not a big Olympic person, and if you're an Olympian in here, more power to you. I don't care. So as, <laughs> as we go in, but I gotta say, when it comes to the Olympics, there is one sport that I do respect above all, and that's the gymnasts. Like when you look at like the American women's gymnastic team, the control they have over their body in the air is fantastic. As a kid who has grown up reading Spider-Man, that's the closest in real life. <laughs> we're gonna get to. Now, I respect it, but it's a sport I know nothing about. So as you're watching gymnasts and the commentators are talking and it's like a foreign language to me, I am the last person that should give them advice, right? However, I also know people who should even, who have least, less of a chance or less of an authority to give advice who would watch it and go, you know what they should have done? They should have arched their back more. And I'm sitting there going, you haven't gotten up the couch in a month. <laughs> and the reason I'm starting off this way tonight is because I'm painting a picture that we as people need wisdom. But hear me very clearly, because we need wisdom, because you need wisdom does not mean there is something wrong with you. An acknowledgement of wisdom means something is right with you. But you need to be open to it. See, the core of wisdom, wisdom comes from the Lord, but it doesn't come from simply showing up on a Sunday night. It doesn't come from simply being in a worship song or a worship service. Wisdom comes from relationship. If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, please remember that. Wisdom comes from relationship, and specifically relationship with Jesus. Without relationship, wisdom is just rules, and we are not motivated to follow rules but we are motivated to deepen relationship. We are motivated to pursue relationship. And so being open to wisdom means having a passion to deepen our most important relationship. Being open to wisdom means we are putting our ego aside and we're saying that God is God. I am not. And God can teach me something in every area. And here's the best thing about wisdom. You don't just need it when your life is falling apart. In fact, that's a big mistake when all of us wait for the emergency or the tragedy to then seek wisdom. What we do in stress tends to not last. What we do in times of peace tends to be our foundation for the times of war. And so tonight, what I'm going to ask you to do as we open up our scripture, as we go in and we talk about a particular topic that's really divisive, would you be open 
to seeking God's wisdom and having him expand your view. Because tonight, the topic on the table that Kelly asked me to come talk about is a topic of sex, is a topic of our sexuality. And the question becomes, how do we as Christ followers approach sex and approach sexuality with wisdom? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. That's a very, very big topic. It's a bigger topic than we have the time for tonight. And so what I'm hoping happens tonight is as we open up our scripture, I hope that we begin a dialogue. Now, not in any sense of rudeness, but just knowing our schedules, not a dialogue between you and me, but a dialogue on this between you and Christ. What I hope tonight is to give you a starting point to begin to talk to the Lord about your sex life. And some of you might be sitting there going, that sounds weird or that sounds cringy. And exactly that's why we need wisdom. Because he's a God of wisdom in all areas, not just the easy ones. And so as we jump into this topic of sexuality, what I need you to do, and don't worry, I'm not going to call any of you out. But I need you to think of your head and I need you to think of your evolution in terms of how you have viewed sex in your life. Do you remember when you were a kid and the idea of even kissing was the grossest thing you could have imagined? I don't know if your elementary schools had this, but in my elementary schools, we used the word cooties. And like they devised like a cootie shot or like you were kind of all like, yeah, no girls allowed or no boys are allowed. Girls suck and boys are stupid. And that is still true. You know, as we go in. <clears throat> so guys, piece of wisdom from a happily married man, stop being stupid. All right, like <laughs> these. because these girls deserve something better. And if you're sitting there going, I'm not stupid, yeah, you are. So as we, that is usually the response of the stupid. So I've been talking to college students for years, I don't care. We're just gonna talk truth, so as we go. On. But do you remember what happened at some point in your life, whether it's puberty or anything? You went and your view of sex was gross and then all of a sudden it felt like a switch went on and all of a sudden your view of sex went hyper the other way. And it was like, oh, the opposite sex, the opposite gender, what do we do? See, we went from a point where we wanted nothing to do with it. In fact, we wanted nothing to do with it. Do you remember the BS answers your parents would give you about where babies come from? <laughs> well, when a mommy and daddy love each other, a magic store comes <laughs> and drops a kid and, and it grows in a patch and it makes a baby. And we bought it. And then later, we realized, no, it's because my parents had sex. <laughs> we watched the video, and you're like, ew. <laughs> <laughs> we watched the video in fifth grade that you needed a permission slip for, and we realized, oh, un unless you were homeschooled. But as we go into that. But we talk about our evolutions, but think about it. I make a joke, but think about it. Some of you have grown up in an environment where sexuality, sexual issues were things that were talked about, things that were comfortable, things that you were exposed to at a young age, and that's not necessarily wrong. Some of you were in an environment where you had the talk or multiple talks. Some of you were in an environment where you felt like the people that were supposed to teach you about sexuality kind of made it a very evil thing kind of didn't want to talk about it, never wanted to bring it up, hoped you would never bring it up, and made you feel unsafe. See, we have a lot of different experiences, and that's just us as individuals. Let's try to put this together with our culture. See, we live in a culture that when it comes to sexuality, there are no holds barred. Sex sells. I used to be a film student, and that was one of the first things we learned in classes. If you want to sell your movie, have a topless girl on the poster because sex sells. What's the big deal? Everybody's doing it. What's the big deal? It's the act. And hear me very clearly, that is an honest question. That is not a vilified question. That is somebody honestly trying to understand a viewpoint. What is the big deal? And then you sit there and go, well, what's the quote Christian perspective? And for many of us, even if we've grown up in the church, the Christian perspective is we know the rule. Don't have sex unless you're married. <laughs> and when we hear that rule, I don't know about you, but we kind of picture this like old librarian nana figure that's like slapping a ruler on your wrists, 
like punishing you for hormones. Oh, you have hormones? You are the devil. <laughs> Those hormones are gonna lead you straight to hell. And for many of us, even those of us that have grown up passionate about Jesus, I'm gonna be honest about my own journey. You sit there and go, I, I wanna follow Jesus. And in these other areas, it seems easy. But in the area of sex, to be honest, it seems hard because it seems outdated. It seems like a rule. And for some of us, maybe I will follow the rule, but I'm doing it with absolutely no joy. Or you know what? Conveniently, that's gonna be one of the quote rules I don't follow because I don't see anything positive of it. Now I'm doing big generalizations, but that's often in the church how the conversation of sex has become. And so even hearing somebody like me get up here and go, hey, we're gonna talk about sex tonight, can honestly, and this isn't wrong, can roll people's eyes going, here we go, another pastor, another person simply saying, God can't believe he made it, don't do it, wait until this context. And the thing that we need to do when we're seeking wisdom is we need to stop and ask, is there a bigger picture? We need to stop and ask, if God said something, what is the context behind it? Let me explain what I mean by that. One of the absolute biggest mistakes we make towards God. And in fact, if you join us on the weekend service, that's what that whole series has been about, our journey of the book of Matthew, is that we put Jesus through filters to make him look like us. And so you know how I talk about assumptions? So when we read something in the Bible, we see it through the story of our lives. When we read something in the Bible, we make assumptions about what it means based on what I think is right and based on what I think is wrong. And so all of a sudden, Jesus looks a lot like me, has my opinions, has my experience, grew up in Simi Valley. If I'm okay with a sin, then my Jesus is okay with me doing that sin because he wouldn't hold me to an outdated rule. If I'm passionate about something, then my Jesus is clearly passionate about it because I am and that's how he wired me. And you need to understand something about scripture. The Bible was given to us, but we were not his original audience. The Bible took place in a radically different world. The Bible took place in a radically different context with a radically different language. And so if we truly want to gain wisdom, then that means understanding Jesus on his terms. And that means learning to see the Bible in context. Let me give you an example that has blown my mind. When Kelly started this series, he spoke about his trip to Israel. Let me share from when I got to go to Israel a few years ago. We were in the old city of Jerusalem. This is like the picture you see. We were right by the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall. And we were waiting for people. And our Israeli tour guide, this awesome guy named Ronan, we're sitting around and he asked us a question. He said, hey, you guys, Americans, <laughs> when you hear that Jesus is a carpenter, what does that mean? And all of us answered the same thing. Woodworker, made tables, made chairs, you know, made stairs. And he's like, okay, that makes sense. You've been in Israel for a week and a half at this point, yeah? How many trees have you seen? <laughs> in fact, we saw a boat in a museum called the Jesus Boat. Not because Jesus owned the boat, but because it's an actual fishing boat from the time of Jesus, like when Peter and his brothers were around it. And to create one boat, took wood from six different types of trees. And so he's making a point. See, the way you guys interpret what it means to be a carpenter is put through an American filter and it distorts the picture. See here, when you use the word carpenter, we use the word contractor. See, the houses are made of stone and brick and mortar. So Jesus was likely a general carpenter, a stonemason knew how to build a lot more than just with wood. So you see how context makes a bigger picture? 
So whenever we go to scripture, it's so key to learn and to ask because that's the pursuit of wisdom. What is the context of this? And so what I wanna share with you before we go to our main scripture is the big context we need to understand of the story of Jesus is wrapped up really well in John chapter 10, verse 10. In that, Jesus says that the devil, the enemy, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. One thing I love about Jesus is he's blunt. He makes it very clear what the devil does. When it comes to you, the devil wants to do three things, steal, kill, and destroy. And then he goes on, he says, but I have come to give you life and to give it to the full. Another translation writes that, that Jesus has come to give you the best life possible. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that money's gonna fall out of the sky, although that'd be awesome. That doesn't mean you're going to get every hope and dream you've ever had because God sees a bigger picture. See, here's what I hope as a dad. See, I'm trying to raise my kids to know that I am for them because even at a young age, but as they get older, as they become teenagers and then young adults like you, there are going to be times when my kids vehemently disagree with me. There are going to be times when my kids are going to challenge, do I have their best interest at heart? Because their feelings are leading them in one direction, but the wisdom of their father is in another one. And I hope that I've done my job, that I have raised my kids in a sense where even if they disagree with me, they know that I want their best. And that's God's relationship with us. When God disagrees with us, it's not because he's punishing you. It's not because he's down on you. It's because he wants to show you there's something bigger. There's a bigger purpose. There's a bigger teaching through this. And when it comes to the church and it comes to sex, we often use the word purity. And isn't that the most like 13 year old like word you can say about this? It's so churchy. And the bummer part is we talk about context, the word purity in a church context, we often mean, oh, they're talking about sex, they're talking about sex, they're talking about sex. When the Bible uses the word purity, it's often not talking about sex. It's often talking about your soul. See, the Bible calls us to a life of purity. A simple definition in context of purity is living in right relationship with God. That means we've given our life to Jesus, That doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it means that we're pursuing. At Rocket Peak, we say we listen and we follow. And one aspect of that is our sexuality, is our sex life. But this is the beginning of context. See, when the Bible calls us to purity, it's calling us to something bigger. It's calling us to a bigger, bigger thing. And so when we hear God's commandment, when we hear God say that sex is reserved for marriage, understand something as we look at the context of it. God is not doing that because he is anti-sex, he is anti-hurt. See, God created this act to work best in context. Because as you like that word, because it's so key. Let me use a different analogy that, that'll get our attention as well. Let me use the analogy of drinking and alcohol. If you're of age and you enjoy to drink, there's nothing wrong with that. You're not getting drunk, you're not getting blasted, but you know if you're of age and you enjoy drinking, that there's a context where it works best. If you are waking up at eight in the morning and putting beer in your cereal, (laughs) get help. (laughs) But do you, Here, the point I'm trying to make, something that could be potentially good is now being used in the worst context possible. And is that even enjoyment? And so when it comes to sex and it comes to these, quote, parameters, God's desire, and this might be a bold statement for some of you, but God's desire is for you to have the best sex life possible. And as its creator, And if you don't think that God is proud of sex, you have skipped over how graphic the Book of Song of Solomon is. (laughs) Fifty Shades got nothing on Song of Solomon (laughs) as we go in. But as its creator, he put it on context. Because one reason why the New Testament talks about sexual sin often is because there's something about, there's something about misusing this act of sex that hurts deeper than many other sins. 
Now in a room this size, we've all had different sexual experiences and different histories. Whatever your background, whatever your story, whether you've been saving yourself, whether you haven't, whether you've struggled with this, whether you disagreed with God, here's something. God is not done with you. God is not sickened by you. God is here to give you wisdom because he loves you and he wants to expand your picture. So I could keep talking about the act of sex itself, but that's like conversation three or four. As I say, I'm opening a dialogue, and the question is, well, if God has put sex within this parameter of marriage between a man and a woman, then why would I obey that when I'm in a dating relationship and I care about this person? Or I'm not in a dating relationship and it doesn't seem like a big deal. Or I feel like this is a struggle I've asked God to take away from me. Or whether you're a guy or a girl dealing with pornography or anything else like that, why am I going to listen to that? What is my motivator? Because when it's just a rule, it's not going to motivate motivate anything. But when it's behind relationship, then we realize a life of purity is protecting my relationship with God in all areas. And one aspect of that is my sexual relationship. Think of it with your deep relationships now. I will make decisions to not harm these relationships, to protect these relationships, because I care about these relationships. And when we begin to see wisdom as the pursuit of relationship, then all of a sudden, when it comes to a sexual ethic, we begin to ask a new question. How will this protect, deepen, grow my relationship with God? Which is the question we should be asking in all areas. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to jump into one of my favorite scriptures, one of the scriptures that really challenged my view of this. And I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament. Now, if you're new, you haven't been to church around you, if you, definitely, I mean, if you haven't spent any time with scripture, you're in the right place. And this is a place where we get to learn together. See, at Rocky Peak, we often describe the Bible because it's a big book. We describe it as a long-running TV series with multiple seasons. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you back to one of the earliest seasons of the Bible, and we're going to be going to the book of Genesis, the very first book. And so if you've got your Bibles, open them up. If you've got your apps, turn them on. If you've got neither, just listen to my beautiful voice. And we're going to be in Genesis chapter 39. Now, as you're turning there, let me again build a little context. I'm very passionate about the word, and I'm a teacher of the word, but my passion is to write myself out of a job, meaning I want to teach all of you how to use scripture so you can use it on your own. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible. See, there is often a misconception with the Old Testament that because in kids' ministries, we often teach Old Testament stories, that the Old Testament was written to kids. Daniel in the lion's den, Moses and the parting of the Red Sea. We see there's as kid stories. The Old Testament was not written to kids. The Old Testament is written to us, and we don't want to be a people that ignore it because it sets the foundation for what Jesus then does. And tonight, we're going to be looking at a man named Joseph, and we're going to be coming in kind of in the middle of his life here. Now, Joseph, sometimes we have this image that these people in the Bible were like these biblical superheroes. What I love about the people in the Bible is, aside from Jesus, they were messed up. It makes me feel like, awesome, I could have been one of them. So Joseph was in from a large family and had a little bit of sibling rivalry that if you have siblings, you understand with. See, Joseph's dad made a mistake that he was very blatant in how he favored Joseph. See, Joseph also had a relationship with God in which God gave Joseph a vision about the future where he would be in charge over his brothers. And what Joseph ended up doing was he let that go to his head and he lorded that over his brothers. His brothers did not like that, beat him, almost killed him, sold him into slavery. And so that's where our story is beginning in Genesis chapter 9. And what I want you to do is I want you to emotionally connect. Even if you've heard of Joseph before, but try to emotionally connect this. He went from being the favored son to a lowly slave. He's been shipped out of his home country to a new culture. Have you ever traveled internationally? As soon as you get in the airport internationally, you realize everything's different, right? He's in a new culture where he doesn't know the language, and he's a slave, which means he's dirt. And that's how our story begins. And so in Genesis chapter 9, starting in verse 1, 
excuse me, Genesis chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard bought him, remember he's property, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Now let's stop there. Again, we want to build context. And one of the questions, building context is simply asking questions. So the first question I would ask in reading this is who is Potiphar? Now, what we're told is that he was the captain of the guard. When you dig a little bit into what this means historically, it means that Potiphar was a captain of an elite group. If you wanna have a modern American military example, imagine Potiphar being the leader of something like the Navy SEALs. But not just that. See, our military has ethics. The Egyptian military, their ethic was brutality. So when historians describe Potiphar's, one historian put it this way, they called Potiphar the chief of the executioners. This was not a jovial man, is it? And this is who bought Joseph. Somehow I don't imagine he's going to treat his slaves well. But look what happens next. The Lord was with Joseph. Would you underline that? Would you highlight that? In your darkest times, when you have been, everything else has fallen apart on you. When you don't know what the answer is, as Joseph doesn't know what's gonna happen here, would you just remember that phrase? Because as it was true for Joseph, it is true for you. The Lord was with you. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, let's stop right there, context, well, what does that mean? It means that Joseph had everything taken away from him, and what he realized was he didn't put enough effort into his relationship with God. And what I mean by effort is not works, but he simply realized that was not a priority. I had everything I thought I needed. This all got taken away from me. God is with me. I'm gonna put more effort in my relationship with God. The best testimony anybody has isn't necessarily our words, but it's our lives. See, a world that can't stand Christians is jaw-dropped when they actually see someone who claims to be a Christian living it out. That's amazing to an unbelieving world. And so the captain of the executioners sees Joseph living out his faith and he's intrigued by it. He sits there and goes, I have, we have hundreds of gods in the Egyptian culture. What is going on with your God? And he began to prosper. Look at verse four. Joseph found favor in Potiphar's eyes. I don't think that's an easy thing to do. Joseph found favor in Potiphar's eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. So Potiphar was likely well off given his position. He was likely rich, had a lot of money going in, had a lot of business ventures. And he said that he built such a relationship with Joseph that he stopped caring about all of it because Joseph was in charge. Now imagine this. Do you have any basketball fans, any NBA fans out here? So Golden State just won the championship, right? Because LeBron's overrated. And so as, <laughs> imagine it this way. Imagine last year, now Golden State had a heartbreaking final last year that they lost to the Cavaliers, but imagine if Golden State last year didn't win a single game. They would have been the laughing stock of the NBA. This is Joseph as he started this. The laughing stock doesn't have anything. Now imagine the Golden State didn't just win the championship, but they didn't lose a single game. That's basically what happened to Joseph here. Joseph became the chief financial officer of the captain of the murderers of Egypt. Probably on his business card. <laughs> and why? Because Potiphar was intrigued by the Lord. And understand something. Remember, as the Bible writes things to understand context, we read it as if this happened in an afternoon. When we read the Bible, we need to understand that these, these things happen over time. 
And so if Potiphar is trusting Joseph, it's because he's developing a relationship with him. Because he gets to know him, he's interacting with him, he's seeing the Lord work in Joseph's life. See, time is going on, and more and more trust is building. And then let's look at what happens next. Verse 7, now, excuse me, the end of verse 6. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. Gosh, out of everybody in the Bible, he got the best description ever. <laughs> I wonder if he's just chilling in heaven going, hey, you guys, remember, chap remember verse 6? <laughs> Woo! Now, it's not a random fact because it makes sense. Verse 7, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Come and have sex with me. I want to cheat on my husband. Now, a couple things to know about Potiphar's wife right now. Based on her request, she is not emotionally stable. Based on her request and her boldness, especially in a culture such as theirs, I'm willing to bet this is not the first time this has happened. I'm also willing to bet, given who she is, given who Potiphar is, it's likely that she was very well off of very beautiful women that she likely has not been turned down before. And look at what happens next. Verse 8, but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Now let's stop right there. That's where I'm stopping with my scripture. But that last verse, Joseph's reason for not sleeping with her, you got to understand something. And this isn't scholarly text. This is me making certain assumptions here. Joseph was good looking. She was likely good looking. She's propositioning him for sex. I got to believe just as a normal guy myself, there's a part of him that was tempted. I got to believe that there's a part of him that went, well, who would know? What would be the big deal? Potiphar doesn't know. She's down to do this. Why not? And they live in a culture and we live in a culture where the answer would probably be like, do it, right? But do you re understand context of why Joseph refused? He didn't say, I don't want to break the rules. He didn't say, I'm worried about consequence. He said, I do not want to harm my most important relationships. Your husband trusts me. I know him. He has withheld nothing from me but you because you are his wife. What would that do to that relationship? And then he goes on and says, I would not do that to him, nor would I do that to God. And think about that in your life. Think about when somebody has stood up for the relationship with you. Think about when you stood up for the relationship with somebody else. Now think about when somebody has hurt your relationship. Think about when somebody has chosen to lie, to slander, to steal, to cheat, to walk away. You see, Joseph modeled wisdom. Wisdom isn't about the rule, it's about the relationship. See, Joseph, even in his darkest times, dug into his relationship with the Lord. The Lord came into his life. He was aware of the presence of the Lord. He was aware that God was still with him, even though his circumstances weren't ideal. And as this temptation came up, and did you catch that last verse? Not once, but over and and over again, she kept asking. And isn't that true of our temptations in life? That they don't tempt us just once. They tempt us over and over again. Specifically, sexual temptations are always there, aren't they? If you're in a dating relationship, it's always there. If you're not in a dating relationship, sexual temptations in a whole multitude of other ways are always there. They happen over and over again. And each time, it is the opportunity to ask, am I going to choose wisdom? But unless we have relationships, relationship, wisdom is not going to happen. Because Joseph isn't sitting there going, oh, shucks, I'd really like to sleep with you, but I'm afraid that God will condemn me to hell if I do. Instead, he knows God well enough to go, you know what? My relationships are too good. Think about that. My relationship is too good. And even though I'm tempted, even though, yeah, this might feel good for a while, I might even get away with it. Why would I settle and sacrifice what is best? And you know what I love about this story and why I'm sharing it with you? Is because that is the power you have. 
because of the Holy Spirit in you. Amen. Joseph was a normal human being who followed the Holy Spirit. You have something that he didn't have. You, as Christ followers, have the Holy Spirit living in you. You have access to the Holy Spirit in a way that Joseph didn't. So now, as we stand here all these years later in 2017, when it comes to wisdom, but when it comes to wisdom in our sexual lives, the question becomes, will you choose relationship over assumptions? And how do you develop wisdom? Well, I'm going to give you one step as we wrap things up. It's time. I've been a pastor for many, many years. I've gotten up here, and I've said this for many years. I've seen little kids grow up and become adults and have families and all that of their own. And I got to tell you, the difference between those that stay with Christ and those that don't is simple. The ones that gave that relationship time were the ones that were in it to win it. So let me give you an example from my own life, something I've, sh I've shared before many times on the stage. See, I've been married for over 11 years, and my wife is my best friend. But imagine if I married her, because when I married her, I promised to love her and put her before all other people. Imagine if I love you, but I'm never going to spend time with you. But if anybody asks, I'm going to say I love you, and I might be sincere about that, but you're never going to see me. Please don't interfere with my life. Uh, you know what? Once a week or like Christmas and maybe Easter, we can hang out for a little bit. And imagine if I treated my kids that way too. Hey, awesome, you're born. I'll see you in a few years. I'll go around. I don't want to be in your life. I don't want to go there. You would say, well, that's not a relationship. Well, the truth of the matter is for many years of my life, I thought that was a relationship with God. I thought that was good enough. I thought that's all I had to do. I showed up like a good church attender once a week. Maybe I went to a small group. Maybe I held my hands up as I worshiped. I'm not vilifying those things, but I thought that's all I needed to do. I was a C student. And what happened was when God knocked me over the head, when he showed me there is something bigger, my life changed to where I never wanted to go back. I experienced wisdom. And believe me, I am very stupid. <laughs> but because of Jesus in my life, gosh, I've experienced wisdom. In my 11 years of marriage, there have been opportunities to highly damage my marriage, to highly damage my relationship with my kids, to highly damage my relationship with my friends or my church. And when that opportunity comes up, I think of Joseph. And I go, what am I going to choose? And so I turn that question over to you. I'm going to invite the band to come on up. And as we go into this time of singing, there's an opportunity for you to do some business with God. And as I mentioned, the question is, what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose relationship? Or are you going to choose assumptions? But hear me very, very clearly. The purpose of the question is not to be a shaming or a guilt question. The purpose of the question is hopefully to be a catalyst towards joy. The purpose of the question is sit there and go, do I need to deepen my relationship with the Lord? And if you're sitting there going, I want to, but I have no idea how, you're in the right place. Because we're here to do this together. If you're sitting there going, but I've messed up. I've done this. I've done this. I don't know your story, but I know Jesus' story. And I know he died for it. And I know he rose again. If you're sitting there going, but if somebody found out, if somebody knew, I don't, I don't know if, I could, if they would relate with me. Well, Jesus will relate with you, and he will be the intermediary for other people. If you're sitting there going, but I've tried in the past, and I feel like I don't know how to do, well, today's a new day. Joseph was just like us, except he didn't have the Holy Spirit living in him like you do. This is our moment. This is our time. This is our opportunity to rise and say, God, we're not going to accept mediocrity anymore. And I'm not perfect, and I'm not claiming to be, and we are not claiming to be. But man, we can have wisdom, especially in such an unwise area. Let's pray. Father, these words out of your scripture tonight, Lord, they're not just for this audience. They're for me as well. I pray that you show us, Lord, you show us how to be passionate about wisdom. Because really, it's being passionate about you. 
It's being passionate about a relationship with you. It's being passionate about seeking you, about choosing you, about knowing you deeper. Gosh, Joseph was in one of the worst experiences of his life. And if you know the story of Joseph, it's just gonna get worse. But he never lost faith in you when the ego and the assumptions and all that fell apart. He said, God is real and that's all I have. And right now that's all I know is that God is with me and I choose him. Father, when it comes to our sexual ethic, we choose you, not because we're gonna follow a rule that's empty and soulless, but we're gonna follow the king that saved us. We're gonna follow the king that gave us a future, that gave us a hope. We're gonna follow the king that said in John's gospel, I want you to experience life into the full. Father, we are not damned by our mistakes. Whatever our past, when it comes to this topic of sex or a lack of wisdom in any area, we are not damned by it because today is a new day that the Lord has made. This is the moment that you change everything. This is the moment that we will look back on in 10, 20, and 30 years and say the words from Genesis 39, the story of Joseph changed everything in my life and I experience true wisdom. Jesus, we choose you. In your son's name, we all said, amen.